your timing is impeccable. Everything will be complete. I hope you'll feel the same in a moment when Interpol are on. Every word you've said for the last 37 days. Schmidt. Show. <laughs> and then you speak to blah 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 blah. You're 50 hours to the journey. Oh, yeah. London. I think. Oh, the weather. Just wait five minutes. Sorry. I was just counting. I have to call my mother. The comms is this way. I have to pee. Apparently, she's ISIS. Books, wherever they are. To the Americans in. We'll find her with a throat cut before. It was fucking disgusting. Tell that. Look, I need... By the way, you can't really smoke in here. There was an incident before I arrived. We want to get to her first. Je m'appelle Imogen Sulte. Right, um, need a doctor. Antibiotics. No. My father used to read them to me. It dictates. What they talk about? I don't know. You know, I've been thinking. To be an engineer. I I'd never been into, you know, good man or bad man. I had very few choices. But I'm afraid that will never happen. It. I will get you antibiotics. It says properly. Do you mind if I smell? You're a liar. Haven't you? It's the big reveal. Is this why they send and babies? Brutal. Life. All I'm doing is try to. I'm harmless. If you. Who the fuck are you? How can you not know? Let's look reaching road trip rules. Let's agree on something else. Okay, we talk. Poets that you like. Just beer? My f anger and self. Identifié au camp de réfugiés comme une haute. Are we? Have long. How it still stands. On pense que ça pourrait être la même personne. It's your turn now. Do you have a man? Ah là. Ils font une dé. Ce type est une vraie plaie. Elle, elle saura la démasquer. Compared to you, everything about me is. Une cellule dissidente. Je vais informer notre agent britannique de cette époque. Give me your arm. 
I haven't asked you for your... When I was younger, I was attacked. Yes. When I... There was a garage. The woman we locked in there. At the camp, the Yazidi women's... It was a mess. It was funny. What about you? I just... I've never killed or could have. Bonjour. Max P. That is a French controlled information. This is only three and a half months ago. What the frack? I hate this fucking. Uh, no right to intercept. Hey, do you when it has been cleared? That's my fucking fault anymore. Sybil. America's officially taken over this investigation. Relations. Long time ago. Why the beautiful daughter of intellect? Zero idea what comes next. Begin. The Veil's first episode opens with a woman named Portia meeting Tomas. Tomas expresses gratitude to her for her assistance, and they celebrate by popping open a bottle of champagne. However, things take a turn when Portia discloses she is an Interpol agent. While Tomas, now known as Imogen, is taken by surprise and placed under jail, Portia departs for her next assignment. The action then moves to a camp for refugees near the Turkish border with Syria, where women and children are squabbling over food. When a lady named Adila is attacked by other refugees and accused of being an ISIS member, tensions rise. Fortunately, Adila is saved as the military arrives just on schedule. When Imogen arrives to the camp to assist the volunteers, one of the men gives her a briefing, letting her know that 10,000 women and children reside there, the majority of whom are Syrians and some of whom are Yazidis. Unfortunately, Isis was able to murder the men. Imogen has a special fondness for Adila, a French lady who is purportedly affiliated with Isis. While traveling, Imogen queries Adila about how she got to the camp and how a Parisian model ends up leading Isis. Adila is initially unresponsive, but she eventually tells Imogen that she and the other women were held captive in a room in Raqqa, where fighters would frequently enter to take advantage of them. She made the decision to release the Yazidi women one day, but first she chose to labor at the refuge camp and take off her niqab to avoid being caught by the fighters. She also shares with Imogen her affection for Shakespeare, her grandfather's communist views, and the fact that she had to leave her 10-year-old daughter behind in Paris in order to avoid becoming radicalized. She asks Imogen to take her to Edip Khoi camp, where she fears the warriors would identify her and murder her for saving women from their grasp. Malik, Dali Bensala, Imogen's point of contact in the French DGSE office, has been monitoring her movements and reporting to Magritte, Thibaut de Montalembert immediately. But they fear that Imogen will be ruined by the presence of the most American, American, Josh Charles's Max Patterson, who is in charge of the US troops' control of the whole situation. Imogen seems to have other plans in spite of her seeming volunteer position. When she calls DGSE's Malik, he gives her the order to transfer Adila to the Edip Koyu camp so the Americans can't find her. Adila is approached by Imogen, who assures her that she will be secure and that she is the key to her survival. Adila invites Imogen into her tent, clearly frightened and afraid for her safety. Adila's internal state of perpetual anxiety is evident, she is reluctant to seek medical attention for her knife wound for fear that it may be poisoned. After that, Adila narrates her story, including how she dropped out of school to pursue a modeling career in Paris. Her tent is soon broken into by angry migrants brandishing knives with the intention of murdering her. Imogen protects Adila from the vicious crowd by repelling the assaults with the help of her training. Afterwards, Imogen approaches the head of the camp and demands that Adila and she be allowed to travel safely. After returning to Paris, Malik informs his superiors about Adila, who the Yazidi witnesses claim is a prominent ISIS leader named Saben al kabaisi Adila insists, nonetheless, that she is innocent. Malik's boss reports that Max Peterson, an American agent, has been sent to investigate the situation with the French. It is also stated that ISIS is preparing a massive strike that is expected to happen in the next 7 to 10 days. 
While traveling, Imogen queries Adila about her personal life in an attempt to ascertain whether or not she is indeed an ISIS leader and not just an innocent individual who has misidentified herself. If you haven't guessed before, Imogen is an MI6 operative that the French have employed to uncover Adila's true identity. Malik is confident that Imogen, being the greatest, can obtain crucial intelligence prior to the coming onslaught. As soon as Max gets to France, he lets Malik know that he will not be easily duped. Intercepting DGSE's intelligence, he asks Malik why Imogen, a pseudonym for her, is traveling in the area of a NATO ally with Adila, aka the genie of Raqqa. Max is also aware of the love relationship between Malik and Imogen. Max tells Malik that the USA is formally taking over the probe for reasons that are not yet known. As the episode draws to a close, Imogen has a change of heart and decides to travel to Istanbul instead of delivering Adila to Edip Koyu. With its incredible start, The Veil is positioned to be one of the finest spy thrillers of the year. As Imogen Salter, Elizabeth Moss excels, while Yama Marwin plays Adila El Idrisi to perfection. The Veil will undoubtedly be a success because of its amazing cast of actresses. Regarding the storyline, Adila first presents as a helpless victim of her surroundings. It may, however, all be an act. It's possible that she is the fervent ISIS leader that the Yazidi women allege she is, assuming the identity of a victim and quickly changing identities to suit the circumstances. Adila is so sly that even Imogen finds it difficult to tell fact from fiction. An elderly man reciting poetry to a girl is part of Imogen's background, but Adila is unaware of this, as the first episode of The Veil reveals. Additionally, she chooses to follow Adila's advice and travel to Istanbul rather than Edip Koy. Begin. Why is there a military uniform inside? That woman too, like. Mede Akwa. Run! Signifié, d'ici sept à dix jours. Max Peterson. Wake up, Tori. Of a NATO ally with only. Explain to me. Find out why. One woman who was at this camp until you. There was a fight. Some of the women. Seal it off and put everything in the bag. Fred, maman? Bien sûr, oui. Oui. Qu'est-ce qui te fait plaisir aujourd'hui? Je vais faire une bêtise. Ça évite les routes à Dibla et Dibkoy. You know, we get back on. Fuck this is. You care so much about my opinion on Billy. Agree with me about the stupid little things that. Until we reach the storm. Everything. Until we cross the French. Only a sacred ritual performed by. I actually took class. Do you really know about religion at all? And a husband? Was it a man? It's the older woman that trip that I could have a more pure. The first time I felt like my life. I driving a car. Normal. They did. Was shake my. Oh, no, you are like the bullies at school. Because when for no reason at all, I say the children. <laughs> Fucking do it. Will you fight me? I don't mean to laugh at you. He's a doctor. Yeah! <laughs> 
their height. Thank you. BSC have a union and a 35 hour work week. With a really weird head. You had at the airport. Yeah. He made his own copy and his side. Our American, the fucking cavalry on the streets of. We are told by command. Types, or shall we? Has been identified by six. Is a 15 year. No. However. Interest. Well, we have a different forms us that she left behind a daughter here. A year old girl was intercepted on her way to school. If the DNA there and her name is Adila Eladrisi. Almost certainly with the most. Right? No need for double agents. Seven to ten days is not that far. Je t'appelle chez toi pour te. Exceptionnel compétent. Here to see Mr. Demir. Mr. Demir no longer takes. Thousand U.S. dollars. Where the fuck did you get ten documents? I want you. To... How long have you known her? She is part of a delegation of folk artists. Yeah. Fucking. D He's paying me to help her. Cost ten dollars now, eight thousand. On two. I've invented a name. Eight years. My grandfather would read devils and one for each day of the week. Any person shouldn't we're gone forever. But not my own. My presence. Prove it. When <laughs> Close the Galata Bridge. Not the DGSC, nor the DG, not the Gina Rakashis. You know that that is, and I will prove it. So I can call my daughter and tell her. At the refugee camp near the Turkish-Syrian border, members of the U.S. military arrive. After hearing from Guy, Dan Wiley and Sandrina, Jonah Ribeiro that the lady they came to get, Adila El Idrisi, is no longer there, Johnson, Kobner Holbrick Smith, takes the lead in the hunt. In order to search for DNA, forensics shut off the tent where Adila was kept apart. Nor, Nadia Labayoen and her 10-year-old niece Yasmina, Kayla and Nayla Barra choose a treat at a bakery in the Paris neighborhood of all Nesu boys. Yasmina walks outside and is kidnapped as Noor finishes the deal, she is then put into the rear of Ansaf. Screaming for assistance, Noor chases after the automobile. It loses her when it rounds a bend. Panic overwhelms her, but as Yasmina rushes back to her, everything is okay. What did they do to her, Noor wonders. Yasmina claims, they pulled out some of my hair. Elizabeth Moss plays Imogen Salter, who spends her nights in her automobile while traveling through the central Turkish province in the Kataya Mountains. Her dreams are visible to us. And now, my dear Violet, it's time to bid farewell to the land of Illyria, her father stated, shutting a twelfth night by Shakespeare book. A blast of explosions. James Purefoy's Michael Althorpe and him playing chess. He says, silly girl, let's get started. Adila El Idrisi, Yumna Marwan is dozing off in the passenger seat when Imogen awakens. A missed call rattles on her phone. Villagers pass their automobile as it is herding goats. The noises also awaken Adila. Entering the DGSE surveillance room, where Imogen's blue dot is displayed on displays, is Malik Amar, Dali Bensala. 
he learns from another agent, Andrea Dolente, that the dot has stayed away from security camera-equipped toll roads. She is obviously going to Istanbul and has abandoned the order to convey the target to Edip Koyu. The subject of belly dance has caused a fight between Imogen and Adila since both of them are obstinate. Adila is left alone in the car with Imogen's phone during a roadside toilet break. She inscribes the number into the windshield by wiping it with her breath. Adila leaves the house and hides it from Imogen's eyes just in time for it to vanish. They decide that until they pass the French border, Imogen is correct about everything they talk about. For the remainder of the journey, Adila will drive. Imogen questions Adila about how she traveled to Syria throughout the journey. She clarifies, the older women are the ones who enlist the girls. A clean existence with God, away from the pollution of the West, was provided to her. I felt like my life had purpose and meaning for the first time. Imogen calls Adila a murderer in jest. She urges Imogen to stop calling her a murderer, stating that she is not one. Imogen challenges her, saying, I'm right about everything until the French border. Returning to the subject of belly dancing, Imogen discloses that she had taken courses when she was expecting and describes how the dance was created to assist women in giving birth. Adila tells her, you said you didn't have children. She says, rather simply, I don't. Imogen attributes her mood on not having any smokes. They almost get into an accident attempting to pass a sluggish truck, so they pull over. Imogen sutures Adila by the car's bonnet when one of her stitches fell loose. She can see a phone number scrawled on the glass of the windshield now that it's become misty. Imogen replies, that's the number of a friend of mine who lives in Paris. He's a doctor. He gives me a call to check on me. At the very least, I hope he is in love with me because I think he could be. She adds she's free to ask to use her phone or even just get a pen and paper. Simply ask. Adila's face seems doubtful, but Imogen appears earnest. Imogen's attitude shifts to one of mistrust as Adila turns around. Imogen gets a call from the same number when she arrives in Istanbul. Once more, she dismisses it. When they get to the traffic halt on the bridge, police are checking automobiles as they go down the line. Imogen's phone flashes a text message, call me now. Imogen notes, I think they're looking for someone in particular. It's getting old, should we go for a stroll? They leave and go on foot. They steer clear of the cops as they pass by the people using the sidewalk. However, it quickly becomes apparent that two guys are pursuing them. After realizing she's being followed, Imogen throws her phone into a fish bucket full of water. Adila and Imogen are pursued through the crowded lanes of the market. In an attempt to find him, Imogen pushes a cart in front of her to obstruct her way. Adila is told to hide behind some storage boxes by Imogen as they dash up a spiral staircase above the stores. After grabbing a metal gas canister, she bolts to the top of another set of steps. The guy comes after her. He blocks Imogen's attempt to surprise assault him with the can. During their altercation, he subdues her. Where is she now? Adila defied Imogen's instructions. She points, here, and the man spins around. Imogen knocks him unconscious with a backhand blow. I instructed you to wait downstairs, she irately declares. Adila inquires, is that your way of saying thank you or something? Max Peterson, Josh Charles is led by Malik to a DGSE sublevel. The Amadeo Modigliani painting, Portrait of Madame Raynaud, on an accent wall diverts the attention of the American. According to Malik, the spies utilize the artworks they borrow from the Louvre as a means of unwinding. Seemingly trying to annoy Malik and cause them to be late for their appointment, Max takes a seat in front of the picture and looks at it. As Malik and Max walk into the surveillance room, Magritte Lavassa, Thibaut de Montalembert chastises them, pointing them that the intelligence community has seen the video of their altercation at the airport go viral. He cautions, you both need to realize we are on the same side. In defense of himself, Malik claims that Max endangered the life of a British agent working for the DGSE, forcing her to give up her one means of contact. While the DGSE is in the dark about Adila El Idrisi, Max boasts that the CIA is better informed about this case than it is. She could have become involved with ISIS, but she's not on the same level as Sabain al kabaisi the female ISIS commander who is most sought and who she is allegedly associated with. Our information also indicates that she abandoned a daughter in Paris, Max continues, removing a plastic hair bag. Imogen possesses the genuine Adila El Idrisi if the DNA matches that which was taken that morning at the camp. 
If they don't match, Imogen is hiding her relationship with Sabain al kabaisi behind Adila's identity. You know, Max leaves, leaving Malik and Magritte alone themselves. The Englishwoman's unique abilities will now not be required, Magritte tells Malik. Adila goes with Imogen to the Turkish Cultural Center, where there's a belly dancer show on the lower floor. The host informs them that there is no room left, but Imogen insists they come to meet Mr. Demir and shows him the $2,000 she is offering in return for helping him go to Paris. The host states, Mr. Demir no longer takes out the trash. Adila takes a purse containing $10,000 out of her waistline, something Imogen was unaware of. Imogen asks where she obtained the money, and he shows her upstairs. Adila queries their purpose for being there instead. She informs her that Adila would go as a belly dancer and that Mr. Demir produces fictitious passports. Imogen is asked by Mr. Demir, Halik Biljana how long she has known Adila. I knew her for decades, Imogen falsely claims. Imogen responds that she does not speak English and that she is a singer and dancer who is a member of a delegation of folk performers. He claims, they closed the Galata Bridge today looking for someone, and he wishes to remove Adila's fingerprints from the cultural center. He reiterates that terrorists made it too tough for him to continue doing this. Adila wonders where she obtained the money after taking it out. According to Imogen, she is being paid by her father, a wealthy Damascus resident, to take his daughter to Paris. When Mr. Demir inquires as to whether they are lovers, Adila speaks out to refute it. She reveals that she can speak English when she says, she is my friend. They promise to send him the final $8,000 when the passports are delivered, so they give him $2,000 immediately. Imogen provides Mr. Demir the information she requests to be on the passport, and they request that two spotless smartphones be added. He says to them, I'll let you know when it's ready. While she waits in Mr. Demir's library, Imogen looks through the bookshelves and decides to take a copy of Twelfth Night. She had a memory of reading it with her father when she was younger, Erin Ainsworth as she thumbs through the pages. And now, my dear Violet, it's time to bid farewell to the land of Illyria, concludes their story time with Marcus Seabright, Phil Langhorn. He gives her a heart tap. Then Imogen visualizes fire. She hears Michael Althorpe's voice referring to her as a silly girl once more when she is brought back to reality. Imogen returns the book to its shelf. Adila has discovered her favorite book, which her grandpa used to read to her when she was a child, Kitab al Bulhan, or the Book of Surprises. She displays a few of the drawings to Imogen. Adila continues, it's about shapeshifters, devils, and jinns. Imogen knows the legend that there are seven jinn kings for every day of the week. Adila presents her with an image of Tuesday's Red King, the one she was most terrified of. My grandfather said the jinn were gone forever, but I still see him in my dreams, she reveals. Imogen and Adila are led back down to meet with Mr. Demir once the cultural center is vacant. He believes Imogen is inviting Adila to dance when she is traveling, which is inappropriate. He begs her to sing in case agents want to hear her demo tape since she refuses. She does, and it appears that Mr. Demir and Imogen are moved as well. Imogen and Adila take a bus to continue their trek. Imogen asks Malik, on her smartphone, who closed the bridge when they were at a rest area. She adds angrily, you promised me I'd be allowed to do my job. He informs her that the Americans are involved and that the lady she is with is actually Adila Elidrisi, saying, there is no longer any need for you to do your job. She's a lost lady fleeing her home, and neither the Americans nor we are interested in her. Imogen is not convinced by him. She decalers, the woman I am with is the ISIS commander we are looking for. I will prove that the woman I am with is the Jin al Raka. Adila is about to move near her when she hangs up. Imogen lets Adila know that now that they know her passport is valid, she may phone her daughter whenever she wants. It's just me and you from now on, Imogen continues. Gazing over her shoulder, Adila walks away to make a call. Imogen inserts the earphones, which are linked to Adila's mobile device. I swear, I will see you shortly. It's getting close now. Everything is resumable. Then Imogen hears a girl on the other end of the call telling her mom how much she misses her. Benjamin Hickel plays Hassid, a guy who visits the cultural center library. Looking over the shelves, he finds Kitab al Bulhan. He discovers a folded piece of paper by the Red King of Tuesday while flipping through the pages. It appears to be a map. He pockets it and walks away.
se dirige vers Istanbul. Il close the Galata. Le target claim to be Adila El Adris. Nous sommes pris. Tout que je dois faire est analyser. Le livre de surprises. Pour tout. Utiliser le DNA de Yvonne. Je suis avec moi, c'est le Janelle Rocca. For all visitors to this camp to report. And so can... The asset is the title of The Veil's third episode. The story advances by presenting us to the inner workings of Isis and its plans after establishing the camaraderie between Imogen and Adila. Once more, the man from the last scenes of episode 2 reappears, but this time he is moving straight toward the camps for refugees along the Turkish, Syrian border. We can see him following the map that Adila placed in the library, giving the impression that he has no fears at all. He approaches the location of Adila's captivity, lifts a boulder through the snow, and discovers the mobile phone she had buried. He shoots the camp director and his accomplice at point-blank range as they try to interfere and inquire for his identify. Then, declaring that the plan is on, he turns on the phone and dials a number that ends in, Monday. By now, it should be rather obvious what the Jinal Raka means when she wishes to perform horrible things according to the days of the week. Meanwhile, we witness an unidentified man giving Adila and Imogen a clue at the airport in Bulgaria. It is reasonable to believe that Adila is intended to be informed by this suggestion that her scheme is underway. After boarding a plane, the two ladies arrive in Paris, where Adila meets her daughter again. After learning about the NGO workers' deaths at the camps for refugees, American intelligence, which had been less involved in the case following the DNA tests, has returned. When Max, the American spy, tries to gaslight Malik for being ineffective once more, the two get into another argument. Regardless, Malik and Imogen eventually make a date, and subsequently, we witness them sharing a bed. It's clear that Malik is infatuated with her, but Imogen doesn't seem to feel the same way. And the person who opened the show by shooting the NGO workers is shot in the head by another man, who we later find out is named Emir and is portrayed by Alex Sikriano. All of this is done to make it appear as though the incident was orchestrated by the Russians. The extreme nature of Adila's and her group's plans is demonstrated when one of her friends requests that two jihadi workers travel to paradise in order to get a massive bomb. Since the two of them must sacrifice their lives in order to insert a chemical safely into the complete apparatus, there must be more to the chemical composition of the aforementioned bomb. We find out that Emir, a Navy officer from Bulgaria, is collaborating closely with Adila, Alex Sikrianu to implement her strategy. Though it's unclear why a naval commander of his caliber would support a plan that may kill thousands of people, it's plausible that Emir had more deeply personal motives given the extreme actions of the two men who committed themselves. But for now, Adila is telling Emir to learn more about Imogen since, even with her experience, Adila finds it hard to interpret Imogen. She wants Emir to double-check before moving farther since she's not sure how much of their plan Imogen knows. Following her time with Malik, Imogen sneaks out to see Adila at an address that is untraceable by French intelligence. Adila questions Imogen directly at the cemetery, wondering why she is assisting her. At this point, we finally see what has been bothering Imogen. She shares with Adila the story of her father, a British ambassador. She tells her about the time he was with him in Istanbul when the Revolutionary Communist Party of Turkey, which the CIA controlled, blew him to pieces. We can now comprehend Imogen's visions during her trip to Istanbul with Adila thanks to this insight. Furthermore, given that Adila's grandpa participated in the revolution in the past and Imogen's father passed away, we may assume that the present procedure is highly personal to her. We're not clear if Imogen is refusing to let Adila in despite knowing what she's going to do at this point. Imogen introduces herself to Adila as an MI6, but it is clear that she is lying to her about being a mother who got mixed up in the terrorist world and is just assisting because she feels she should be able to keep her daughter near. Following their brief conversation at the cemetery, Imogen and Adila go to a pub, where Imogen makes sure Adila thinks she has no idea that she is the DJNN Al Raka. 
she goes so far as to alert her to the possibility that she may be captured and tortured by both American and French intelligence. But she promises to do all in her power to get her out of it. At the pub, two things happen. First, Imogen sneaks out for a smoke, and we find out that she has been collaborating with US intelligence for some time. Her motivations for betraying or concealing information from Malik and the French intelligence services are unknown, but given her outspoken nature, I assume she came to the conclusion that the Americans would be a better resource for information and military support. Imogen requests that Max verify that the CIA was accountable for the killing of Marcus Seabright, who happens to be Imogen's father, in return for providing Max with the first-hand information. We notice that Imogen has information on Max, and he may provide it to her, until he declines. Second, Adila gets a message from E, who could be Eric, urging her to come along so that everything can be resolved. Now, her, might be either Adila's daughter or Imogen. As we don't know what the message is about, I'm going to assume that Eric is Adila's partner. At one point, Imogen tells Max that although Adila is a commander with a solid strategy, she is also a mother who just wants to get away from it all. We may presume that she would still desire Imogen's assistance in order to protect her daughter. Emir is aboard a ship sailing toward the United States at the conclusion of the Veil vale episode 3. Adila's, Monday, plan obviously calls for destroying the United States. Her other accomplice is seen bringing the completed bomb to the port where Emir's ship is berthed. I was... I need to find out... Was very sick for two minutes. I knew my phone would be bugged. Explained he was a cover for the CIA and that they assassinated with her daughter. I need her to believe I... So what's your real name? The inscription is in Greek. I love him. <laughs> it was a card from the grave. One of medium build, dark overcoat. Don't practice, just stay calm. You can get eyes on him now. I'm on my way. How I thought Paris would be. Agent down. Check on Philippa now. Right fucking. The new episode begins in the cemetery, where we last encountered Imogen and Adila. Emir visits Jim Morrison's grave and picks up a package, but Max has already stationed an American agent there, and he informs him of this. However, before Max can assist them in determining how to bring Emir in, he shoots the agent point blank, murdering her. Adila, who has been residing with Imogen for the time being, says farewell to her daughter, and the two ladies briefly discuss their luxurious surroundings. We learn that Imogen was in a subservient relationship with Michael, who was considerably older than she and an acquaintance of her father. The little memories we saw in the first three episodes were about Michael and Imogen, not her father. FX's spy thriller series The Veil returns this week with new developments as French and American intelligence services work to avert an ISIS-led terrorist assault. Later in the show, it is discovered that the card Emir picked up included a little SIM card. The man had undoubtedly visited the location to grab this SIM card, since it was part of the next stage of his strategy. The card that Emir picked up had a specific graphic on it, which helped him distinguish it from the other cards at the cemetery. The image depicted a djinn, and as French officials disclosed, the terrorist cell was utilizing these images from the Book of Surprises, or Kitab al bulhan as a form of covert communication. Only those who are familiar with the material provided in the book will be able to grasp the day that a certain djinn picture represents. French intelligence, which has been perceived as falling behind, recruits a fresh agent to gain access to the American monitoring infrastructure they have hacked all of Max's chats. This latest addition to the roster in the guise of comedic relief is really lazy. Saya, the new tech man, is an example of depicting geniuses as individuals who don't want to take care of themselves and are always like, hell yeah, I can crack this thing, but this character in particular feels really forced. Emir and his colleagues are aware that the SIM cards they will use would be immediately traceable, requiring them to change them on a regular basis. In this manner, each stage of the terrorist operation has been allocated a specific jinn based on the Kitab al-Bulhan, and a whole secret code has been created. 
The DGSE officers have long been wary of their American colleagues in the CIA, particularly Max Peterson, and in this episode, they take a specific effort to learn more about what Peterson and his associates have been hiding. Magritte, the organization's leader, enlists the assistance of Cesar, a tech specialist with poor personal hygiene, and together they overpower the American communication system. According to information obtained from this source, British MI6 operative Imogen Salter has most definitely been working directly with Peterson, which surprises DGSE agent Malik Amar. Although Magritte had always been skeptical about Imogen and her motives, Malik honestly thought that the lady, with whom he was also romantically involved, was assisting them. This abrupt finding that she was in direct contact with Peterson and working with him shocks him. Malik finds contact with Imogen and confronts her about what she has been doing, but the lady makes no attempt to conceal anything. He attempts to impose French regulations on her, claiming that no foreign espionage agency may take out any counter-terrorism operations on French land without the DGSE's permission. Imogen promises answers during a covert meeting, and Malik asks his employer for one final opportunity to control Imogen. During this time, DGSE officials are able to track down and listen in on a phone discussion between Emir and an acquaintance in which he discusses the ship heading toward the US coast with a bomb aboard. The monitoring is carried out using bugs previously installed at a restaurant from where Emir makes the call, and it is possible that he and his companions are attempting to deceive the intelligence agency by providing false information. Nonetheless, Magritte decides to warn the US authorities about the impending terror assault, despite the fact that they were the ones who decoded this critical information. That night, when Malik and Imogen finally meet, he tells her everything the DGSE has discovered so far, including the secret code containing the jinn's names. Imogen claims that Adila showed her this book of surprises while in Turkey, which convinced her that Adila was definitely pulling the strings in her ISIS cell. The heroine once again demands that Malik trust her intuition and allow her to continue her inquiry into Adila El Idrisi. Nonetheless, Magritte decides to warn the US authorities about the impending terror assault, despite the fact that they were the ones who decoded this critical information. That night, when Malik and Imogen finally meet, he tells her everything the DGSE has discovered so far, including the secret code containing the jinn's names. Imogen claims that Adila showed her this book of surprises while in Turkey, which convinced her that Adila was definitely pulling the strings in her ISIS cell. The heroine once again demands that Malik trust her intuition and allow her to continue her inquiry into Adila El Idrisi. Since Imogen has been following the CIA agent's directions and keeping her friendship with Adila, Peterson fulfills his promise and provides Imogen a USB disk with important information regarding her father. At this point, the CIA agent also claims that what transpired in Morocco was not what it appeared to be. Imogen had exploited the issue in Morocco to force Peterson into helping her learn more about her father. However, what happened in Morocco is still unknown, and we may learn more about it in future episodes. After printing out multiple pages of CIA secrets, Imogen reads over all of the material on the USB drive at the end of the Veil vale episode 4. Imogen discovers from these papers that her father, Marcus Seabright, was a double agent who had illegally spoken with the Russians. Marcus was found to be leaking CIA intelligence to the Russians, which is why he was executed by the CIA, with the crime disguised as a terrorist assault on his automobile. It is unclear how the protagonist would respond to this revelation and whether she will continue to examine the problem. In the fourth episode of The Veil, vale, Adila becomes closer to her new friend Imogen and even discusses a prior occurrence. Adila had been sent on a suicide bombing mission in her early days with ISIS, when she was forced to wear explosives all over her body. Her aim was to go to a luxury restaurant favored by American visitors and blow it up, killing everyone, including herself. But Adila couldn't make up her mind to do it, and even though she went to the restaurant carrying the bombs, she couldn't turn the switch that would set him off. While recounting the story, she informs Imogen that the fuse in the explosives did not function, which is why her plan failed. However, the heroine claims that she was well aware that Adila would be unable to carry off the bomb blow since she was not as nasty. Later in the episode, Adila takes Imogen to a small bar in Paris, where she covertly meets Emir. In the last episode, Adila got a text message, now believed to be from Emir, instructing her to bring Imogen to a specified location so that the MI6 agent could be dealt with, and the club is clearly this designated location. However, Adila begs Emir not to kill Imogen, which the guy clearly ignores, and the two ladies are soon ambushed by a swarm of armed men. Although Imogen is plainly their target, 
Adila assists her buddy in escaping the attack since she is also playing a game with the MI6 agent. I had an operative shot in there. The ship is departing. Are you hoping to see some old friends? They're using an investigation on getting her to tell me the name of... Department is bugged by both the CIA. All right, thank you. How the fuck? How? Oh. How the? Fuck? And I know what's missing because I make it a point. Okay, to whom leave as a cleaner? He's undoubtedly. <laughs> I can answer the call, Russia. That's what's going to be. It's not what. Answer. The two ladies at the core of the story are similar to each other, and that is the only thing that links the story together. The show didn't really want to deal with any of that stuff in the first place. Episode 4 ended with an extremely inebriated Imogen discovering her father was a Russian double agent. When she awakens on her desk in the beginning of the next episode, she discovers that Adila has fled. Adila, a very astute ISIS agent, eluded the vigilant eyes of the Americans and the DGSE by changing identities with a delivery man who enters Imogen's flat and then returns as a housekeeper. Imogen contacts them for support after realizing that her flat has been bugged by both of the participating country's troops. Adila's only escape would be through the cleaner, who would be aware of her whereabouts. But before Imogen can ask him any questions, the French soldiers find him and murder him as he attempts to escape. It is formally proven that she is the Jin Al Raka when she meets up with Emir in the delivery man's car after fleeing the apartment. She came up with the idea to bomb the US harbor, and it looks like she will wed Emir just before he blows himself up. It's difficult to tell if she is actually the one dealing cards, despite the fact that she is presented as the operation's mastermind. She is clearly being blackmailed by Emir, and if she backs down, her daughter's life might be in jeopardy. We also witness him giving Adila the bomb's detonator. At this point, Emir orders Adila to kill Imogen by enticing her to her grandfather's house, where she must stab Imogen to death in order to show her commitment. Emir and the leaders of the jihadi organization question Adila's motives. She claims that she won't be able to murder her, but Emir grants her desire and informs her that he would choose another agent to carry out the assassination on her behalf, she only needs to bring her there. Has Adila grown up all of a sudden? Is she truly the monster we believe her to be? Right now, not a lot of information is clear. Having allowed Adila to escape Imogen's control, Max is furious. Thus, when he meets with state senate representatives to inform them of the incident, he holds Imogen and the French government equally responsible. In addition, he suggests an immoral scheme to abduct Adila's daughter Yasmina in order to persuade her to reveal which US port the explosives are intended for. All of this plot is made public to the DGSC and Imogen after Max's chat is intercepted by French intelligence. Later, Max informs Imogen that her activities are ending and that her services for America are no longer required. Max is unaware that his communications have been bugged. With any case, Imogen gets a text from Adila inviting her to meet at her grandfather's house when she is aimlessly wandering the street with a Morse, MI6 agent straight face. Imogen is kind of worried when she gets there but she is also upset with Adila for breaking her trust. While Imogen works to save Yasmina and bring the mother and daughter together in England, she informs Adila of what the Americans want to do with her daughter and issues a dire warning for her to flee Paris immediately. Adila gestures to the assassin who is going to stab her after learning that Imogen is still somewhat worried about her despite knowing the truth. But Imogen has her revolver ready, and she forces the assassin to flee the area. Before the Americans can kidnap Yasmina, we witness two persons in garbage collector costumes breaking into her apartment building and cunningly removing them. It's clear that Imogen fulfilled her vow and accomplished her goals. 
she's still a spy, not a savior, though. Thus, when she drives Adila off, they pull into a petrol station, where Imogen attempts to do almost exactly what the American and Emir intended to accomplish. She makes an attempt to coerce her daughter into disclosing the locations of the ports where the explosives are being sent. Adila becomes enraged and chastises Imogen for her deceptive statement. Imogen, on the other hand, has had enough of Adila and warns her to stop being virtuous and strong only because she is a mother, even if she is actually a monster who will murder thousands of people. Adila thus unleashes her wrath on Imogen by exposing the advantages Imogen has as a white woman, a woman in a position of authority, and someone who will never be able to comprehend the suffering of motherhood. Imogen hasn't been particularly forthcoming about her history, but her rage suggests that she was slain and had a daughter as well. The ending of the veil in spite of her best efforts to keep Yasmin and Adila safe, Imogen becomes enraged at Adila in episode 5 for being so unappreciative. She makes an attempt to leave the petrol station, but something hits her once again. She tells Adila, on the spur of the moment, that she knows she is not a monster and begs her to accompany her, threatening chaos if she does not. All he was to you? This. I will still help you. But your daughter, use her as leverage to Alice's team around a girl. They had them pinned in the I'll see her until you give me the name and location Think of doing exactly the same thing. That you are a human being and you're gonna do the right. Sorry. This is England. Her is Canterbury. Stand in here. Run. Go. 0 minutes, 44.6 de surveillance de Canterbury. Entendu. Reconnaissance okay. spatiale, c'est des conneries, on a mieux que ça. On sait qu'elle est là. Ah oui, tiens, on la perd là, la 11. Do you mind if I borrow your cell phone? I'll just be a sec. Ok. Yes! We got frick me. Eat a bag of frick. <laughs> God. They are. Give them a fucking minute. Oh, really? It's back of a jump them. It's despite everything she's been through. You would what? All the way from Guildford to up. just gave me the answer. God bless you. Okay. The British have come 48 hours to get the name of that ship. Je peux la trouver. They'll either think we're getting a train north or a train west. Go fast and stay together. Hello. Welcome home, miss. Who's the kind of spy that is rich? Learning new identities of people. This week marks the finale of FX's spy thriller series The Veil, which has several significant discoveries in an exciting but rather unconvincing sixth episode. Yasmina, Adila's daughter, had already been freed from Paris by Imogen, who wished to bring the child back to her mother in exchange for Adila disclosing the identity of the ship that was transporting the bomb to America. Conversely, the Jinn of al Raqqa, their primary objective, is promptly targeted by the French and American agencies, the DGSE and the CIA, respectively, who once again turn into fugitives with the assistance of the MI6 operative. Overall, despite the fact that we saw very little of it, the veil has been hinting at a very personal plot to take center stage. In the end, Imogen's personal history does win out. Following Yasmina's safe relocation to the UK by the MI6 agent, Adila El Idrisi was given one more opportunity by the show's heroine, Imogen Salter, to collaborate with her and strive for a reunion with her little daughter. Proven to be an ISIS agent, dubbed the Jinn of Al Raqqa for her ability to blend into any narrative and persuade others, Adila's want to be with her daughter outweighed any plan to exact revenge on the West. In order to stay out of problems with the intelligence services and her own terrorist team, she ultimately decides to be with Imogen. 
The truck, which is presently somewhere around Canterbury, has crossed the border from France into England, and the two women are spotted inside its storage compartment for protection. He had consented to sneak the two into England after Imogen had falsely promised him certain physical favors, and once they were in the nation, she soon brought him down. However, by now, word had also gotten out about Imogen going rogue with the perilous Adilla by her side, and the two women were promptly in hot water with the local police department. Before the main character can utilize her own cunning and persuasive abilities to get a ride to London, Imogen and Adilla part ways in the town of Canterbury. Since she currently knows that no one would be willing to assist Adilla, Imogen contacts the only person she knows who would be prepared to take a chance and aid Adilla. She just so happens to know someone who, although having started out as an intelligence agency operative, is not directly under the control of MI6 or any other government agency. It turns out that this person is Michael Althorpe, a man Imogen used to be quite close to. In addition, although she was keeping Adilla safe in Michael's Paris flat, she had been staying there when their amorous history was first mentioned. However, Imogen responded to Adilla's questions about him by saying that Michael was only her father's pupil and later on, he also became her instructor. Right now, Imogen contacts Michael to let him know about Adilla and the predicament she finds herself in. Imogen really wants the mother and daughter to be reunited, even if she is officially trying to use Adilla as leverage to get the name of the ship carrying the explosives. This may be the reason Imogen is such a skilled spy, she is the story's heroine because of her capacity to negotiate arrangements for both parties. So that she and the French woman may go to Canada, where Yasmina and her aunt Noor would also be transported, she asks Michael to set up fictitious passports for them. The idea is for Adilla and her family to go to Canada, where they will be able to stay away from all of the law enforcement and other groups who are searching for them. However, Imogen soon learns that Michael does not intend to let Adilla to leave the country, even though they had agreed to the plan over the phone, thus the plan is not carried out to a satisfactory degree. Even though Michael Althorpe first appears in person in The Veil vale Episode 6, his influence and dominance over the protagonist's life were already evident in previous episodes. Imogen was first introduced in the series as someone who was frequently troubled by a particular memory of being uncomfortable with a guy who was much older than her, even though she was unable to articulate it. It is now established that this man was Michael, her father Marcus Seabright's most beloved pupil. Marcus was appointed as the younger man's mentor since he was an experienced MI6 agent and Michael appeared to have recently joined the organization. The two became close. Though it's unclear if Imogen and Michael met at this exact moment, it's likely that they did so after Marcus passed away. Imogen, having lost all parental guidance, was placed in Michael Althorpe's care, notwithstanding the latter's disappearance from the public eye at this period. As the heir to a prosperous aristocratic family, he acquired a magnificent home in the English countryside, where he lived in seclusion for the remainder of his life. Additionally, Michael had a strong relationship with Imogen, basically, she was his pupil and protege, at this particular residence. Marcus began teaching and shaping Imogen to be as cunning as him, just as he had helped Michael become a great spy. But gradually, this instruction transformed into sexual grooming, as the guy practically trained Imogen, a much younger woman than himself, to accept his advances. Imogen knew that something was wrong and that she did not feel comfortable in the setting, but she was powerless to change it. Michael tried to exert his influence over her even now, having been trained to become his object of desire to manipulate any time he pleased. It is probable that Imogen became pregnant with Michael's kid at that time, and she even gave birth to the child, even if the series does not explicitly state this. But as Michael was still leading a very secretive life, the baby's existence would have presented a great challenge to him, and he most likely managed to get rid of it. Everyone agreed that the baby had died naturally, even if he may not have done anything overt that would have forced Imogen to confront him. Imogen still grieves about not being able to have a child, though, and for this reason she supports Adilla in order to allow her to spend time with her daughter. Despite having avoided Michael throughout her life, Imogen now goes back to the exact home and surroundings of her abuser, only this time she helps Adilla make it out alive. Photographs of Imogen, Adilla, and the DGSE and CIA operatives are found in Michael's personal office in his expansive estate, along with notes on all the events pertaining to them. This indicated that Michael had been closely monitoring the particular mission, which at first glance appeared to be of personal significance to him. But Imogen also discovers some torn pieces of paper on the ground that appear to have been thrown out hastily, the papers are in Russian and mention the Jinn of Al-Raka. 
a copy of the Kitab al-Bulhan, which contains quotes from the many jinns symbolizing the seven days of the week, is also included in his files. Ultimately, it is evident that Michael had a significant role in the planning of the entire terrorist act. Imogen confronts the guy about the same issue, and he does not refute his involvement either. It is then that Imogen learns that the terrorist assault was actually FSB planned. The Russian Federal Security Service, FSB desired to exact revenge on its long-standing adversaries in the United States of America, but they also desired to shift the blame. This was the reason behind the reactivation of the ISIS sleeper cell and the preparation of a biological strike using a radioactive bomb, both of which were funded by Russia. However, the FSB required outside assistance in this area, and that's where Michael Walthorpe stepped in, as an ex-MI6 agent with a great deal of authority and influence. Like his own mentor and advisor Marcus Seabright, Michael was a double agent who collaborated closely with the Russian Federal Security Service. Michael also discusses why he thinks the world is going toward tremendous bloodshed and catastrophe, which is the reason he supports this planned terrorist operation. In the event that the planned bombing on the US East Coast goes through, the nation would undoubtedly strike ISIS and invade nations where the terrorist group is in control as payback. Russia would then have the opportunity to strike its own adversaries, leading to international conflict. Since the existing state is certain to collapse very soon, Michael and those who share his beliefs think that the complete chaos and destruction will aid in the establishment of a new global order and a fresh start for humanity. Additionally, it is implied that Michael has deeply bigoted views against Arabs and Muslims in general, especially Patrick, his dependable driver and go-to guy, the DGSE and CIA operatives, Malik Amar and Max Peterson, respectively, arrive to the same property in London, where Imogen used to reside, as Imogen is discovering all these secrets in Michael's house. Malik spent a few romantic days with her here after meeting her, but he can't seem to discover anything helpful there. Malik says he knows where the ladies would be, so the two agents decide to cooperate when Peterson shows up to investigate the same area. After all, Imogen had told Malik everything about her life and her background because she was really in love with him. With this information in hand, he determines that she had to have gone to Michael's mansion to ask for assistance. Ultimately, the women get an advantage from their stay in the house when Malik murders Michael before he can hurt Imogen. Conversely, Max manages to spare Adila from being killed by the racist Patrick. In the last moments, Imogen approaches the brink of forcibly removing Adila from the house, but in a sudden turn of events, Patrick uses his sniper rifle to kill Adila before Imogen can intervene. It was clear that the driver's boss had given him orders to make sure Adila kept quiet about the ship carrying the bomb, and the only way to do this was to eliminate Adila completely. Adila had penned the ship's name on the car's misty glass, much to the relief of Imogen and the rest of the Western world, as she had been afraid she would not make it out in time. Adila's character is also saved by her move, since she decides to prevent the terrorist attack even though she was initially going to use her phone to explode the bomb, the final stage in the plot. Imogen and Malik flee the gunfight and promptly report the ship's information to the police. The operatives then attack the ship and murder Emir as he attempts to detonate the bomb, which is evidently unsuccessful because Adila had not completed her portion of the plot. As a result, Neither the ship nor any direct casualties result from this botched terrorist assault plot. Even though Adila loses her life in the process, Imogen honors her pledge and makes sure Yasmina and Nor go safely to Canada, where they will make their permanent home. In the epilogue of The Veil, vale, Imogen reads through Michael's files once again and keeps seeing the same name, Sebastian Illyria, who resides close to Oxfordshire. She walks over to the address out of fear of being caught in the open, but before she gets near enough, she witnesses someone drive off. Even nevertheless, Imogen makes the decision to look through the belongings in the house and discovers letters and pictures of her and her father there. She comes to understand that her father had been alive for the whole time and had only remained concealed from the public due to the blowing of his double agent cover. Since the two were still in contact in the English countryside, Michael also went into hiding following Marcus' purported death. But since Marcus Seabright was still employed by the FSB, Imogen also realizes that her father, Marcus Seabright, had to have been the mastermind behind the staged terrorist assault. He must have gotten in contact with the ISIS cell and coerced Adila into doing the task in exchange for her release from the terrorist group. This implies that if the Veil ever makes a comeback for a second season, we may just witness Imogen, or Violet, as her true name is revealed, pursuing her own father, as their goals and philosophies are quite different. As the Veil season 1 comes to a close, 
the lead character receives a call from her MI6 superiors once more and is promptly tasked with taking on a new investigation, this time in Greece. <laughs>